Hello everyone, Steve Marinucci back with a, another Beatles News Brief. Today is October 23rd. Um, it's been a while since we uh, did one. We uh, did one uh, in the middle of last week and we haven't done one since then. Um, we had some feed issues, but those have been resolved and we'll talk more about that later in the show. Today, uh, October 22nd, it was announced that Giles Martin has been named the head of audio and sound for Universal Music Group. Um, according to the announcement today, he will lead UMG's exploration and ad adoption of emerging audio formats and consumer technology, inspiring artist creativity, providing the best possible listening experience for fans. Which sounds like uh, he's going to be doing a lot of technological work. Um, as he has been doing, actually, with the Beatles, but he's, it's going to be uh, expanded uh, completely. How much this will mean that he will not be concentrating on the Beatles, we don't know. But in any event, um, that's uh, good news for him, and congratulations to Giles. Um, we were in Berkeley, California last Friday night, for the Princess Leia's Stolen Death Star Plans concert by Pallet Swap Ninja uh, and the Awesome Orchestra at Hertz Hall in Berkeley. And what a show that was. It was a great show. Um, I, can, I, I, I can't say it enough. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was great to hear um, excerpts of John Williams' Star Wars war score in, in front of a full-size orchestra. And then hearing, hearing and seeing the album performed in front of us was just wonderful. It was a great show. The good news is that there may be other shows. Um, we were told after the show by Dan Amrick, one half of the group, that other shows may be in the works, but they have not been arranged yet. Um, but the good news is, for those of you that did not attend... The show was recorded and will be released free online. Exactly when this will be, we do not know, but it will be available free online like the album was. So there's some really good news. Um, they, uh, like I said, they started the show with um, some segments of the John Williams score. The main part of the show began with the 20th Century Fox fanfare, of course, and then the album, and then they played um, a song called Leia Organa, which is a rewrite of Lady Madonna. If you say Leia Organa and Lady Madonna, you'll, you'll get that. And that is on YouTube already uh, uh, in a studio version, but not uh, a live version. We did put a video of Leia Organa on our Beatles News and Information page if you want to check that out. And then the finale of the show was Hey Jude, one half of Palette Swap Ninja is Jude Kelly. So that's kind of the reason why they did that. But that was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And we hope they get other, uh, I hope other shows happen. Uh, I hope it, very much that, that other shows happen. It was a, it, it'd be fun to see live. And Goodness knows where this could take them. I and I hope uh, and I wish them all the best of luck. Um, since we're getting close to the 50th anniversary of the White Album, we thought we'd ask Candy Leonard, the author of Beatleness, the great book which explores Beatle fandom, for her thoughts on that period in Beatles history and how it affected fans. And we recently talked with Candy, and here's some of that discussion. I want to welcome to the show, my first live guest, and it's Candy Leonard, the author of Beatleness, a book that I have loved since it came out, and I'm very, very honored and pleased to have you here, Candy. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Let's talk about, uh, let's go back a little bit before we talk about you know, uh, we're we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the White Album, but let's talk a little bit about how we got to where we are now, um, from you know the Beatlemania days to now. Uh, I mean, uh, where where were uh, what's ha what happened? What happened with Beatle fans between '64 and '68? 
<laughs> if you, I know if you can. I know that's a that's a lot to ask. What happened to them? Well, they I were, mean, if you can, if you can shrink it, shrink it. They they what? They became beetleized. 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 I mean, you know, I, I'm working on a piece of writing now, and and I was reminded that um, you know fans refer to the experience of you know, watching the Beatles evolve, hearing the music evolve over that period, which for us in the U.S. was about a six-year period. They describe it as an odyssey, as a journey, as a, uh, you know, a, a ride, you know, and, um, you know, and, and all of these words have the suggestion of you're different when you come out at the other end, you know. So the White Album was you know, kind of towards the end or getting towards the end of the active years. But obviously the fact that we're sitting here talking about this 50 years later, really it has not ended. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was, you know, the the end of the uh, psychedelic period, which, well, the year before that ended, they, they had just come back from uh, India, which we watched with rapt attention. Um, what was all? What were they doing now? That was fascinating. I mean, everything they did just you know grabbed our attention. So you know, '67 was the the psychedelic period. A lot of fans, as I talk about in the book, um, you know, did not necessarily love all that uh, stuff that came out in '67, including Pepper. You know, which people have different feelings about now in retrospect, but. Um, you know, the White Album was a sense of like getting back to basics. You know, these are the Beatles that that fans that many fans remembered. You know, that they were that all well, that kind of artifice was dropped, and 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 here they were, just four guys playing rock and roll. You know, which was um, you know very exciting to a lot of fans. The other thing about the White Album is that. Um, it also made it, it brought back dancing to the Beatles, which was a very important part for young fans. Not only young fans, all fans, but I mean, female fans, I suppose, especially because men, for some reason, don't dance. I guess they're too cool. But um, you know, one of the <laughs> early one of the early thrills was moving to Beatles music. You know, and so really, from Rubber Soul on, that was kind of not really a thing anymore. And so, one of the, the White Album is quite danceable at parts. So that was something that a lot of um, fans liked. But it was, a, it was a sprawling uh, collection. One fan described it as a, a hodgepodge, a smorgasbord, you know, that was like, you know, any, all the different genres represented. It was, uh, it, was the, it was the biggest, it was the longest letter they ever sent us. Mm -hmm. I, never I, thought, I never thought of it as danceable, though, uh, to be honest. I, I, that... That's something that never really crossed my mind. Um, I mean, I you're talking about like birthday and back in the USSR, and I mean, uh, not blah, 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 blah. I mean, there there are just I think the I think fully one third of the songs. I think there are about maybe nine or ten that um, are danceable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's 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 interesting. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. It it doesn't surprise me that you haven't thought about that because I think that this is an aspect of them, of the fan experience that, um, you know, it doesn't get talked about much, but part of that thrill early on was this dancing and connecting and moving and, you know, because when, when you're listening to music and dancing, it becomes a, a more immersive experience in a way. And I think particularly for younger fans and female fans, um, that was a very big part of that joy that people always talk about was moving to the music. I mean, not that they didn't like Revolver, uh, you know, the other non-danceable stuff, you know, not that they had, there was an active dislike of it, but, but with the White Album, there was that opportunity again that had not, uh, you know, had, it, it was not there. Mm -hmm. I, think, mm -hmm. I, I think, too, that, um, you know, a lot of the sort of, well, certainly the history of the Beatles, the writings about the Beatles, the the way that the important, quote-unquote, important things about the Beatles have been defined have, frankly, really been mostly by men. And so I think that when you have, you know, lately, in the last few years, more women who are studying and writing about the Beatles and, and researching them and whatnot, I think you're going to start to see a lot more of these 
sort of aspects that people didn't necessarily think about before because you have a different um, set of eyes, a different sensibility looking at the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was the the danceability thing, was that more of a, do you think that was more of a female? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, dancing in general is more, I mean, if you, I mean, think about your own experience uh, going to a, even like, let's say you went to a Beatles tribute band performance, you know, that you look, I mean, you know, I'm not saying men don't dance, of course they do, but in general, (laughs) it's going to be more women dancing. I think partly it's because women are more used to being looked at. And so the idea of people going to be, you know, the, the idea that people might be looking at you is less disturbing to women in a way than it is like men are not used to being you know objects in that way I'm not sure I mean I'm still actually thinking you know trying to figure this out myself as to why this I mean I've been reading stuff about this and one of the things is that um, you know that men seem to prefer this kind of cool distance you know it's it and you see this early on with the Beatles too in other words the girls were the fans you know they were kind of out of control the the the, the boys you know dug them from a distance and kind of bopped their head maybe tapped a foot but they weren't dancing you know so I'm not really sure what that's all about it's something I'm still thinking about and reading about and um but it but I but um it, it's definitely a gendered thing. Okay. How about relating to the individual Beatles? How, how did the fans relate to the individual Beatles now, or at this point, as opposed to earlier? What was the difference? I mean, it seems to me that the Beatles had, we knew, well, we all kind of knew the Beatles had grown up, and mm-hmm. we, and most of us accepted it, probably not all of us, though. But mo- I think most of us did. Um, I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't think some have ex- accepted it still. <laughs> but I think a lot of people realize that that they. I mean, because they they had. I mean, they they'd all. I'm thinking now. Uh, they pretty much all had gotten married by this point. Um, so they were all. You know, they they were no longer available. But they but they also, you know, had evolved. I mean. They were all doing different things in their lives besides the Beatles, or pretty much. Right. Is that well, it's really back in '66, where you start to see that, you know, when they got off the road, where they had the time to, you know, kind of explore their, you know, become more individualized, and we saw all that as it happened. Um, but you know, there was this sense with the White Album, and of course the the four separate photos. Mm-hmm. I have fed that sense of them being separate grown up men, you know, um, and the poster in all those uh, photos on the collage, there's really, I think there's only one group photo, if I'm remembering that right. Yeah, I don't, Maybe, I don't have the poster in front of me. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was, wrote about something about it. I, I think there's, yeah, if I'm remembering, I think there's maybe only one group photo on that entire. Uh, poster and the largest image is the one of John on the phone with you know on the, sitting on the bed and mm-hmm. Yoko mm-hmm. is in the background. So there was definitely the sense that they were, um, you know, separate entities. Although things I've read recently say that that was not true. So who knows? Well, they uh, they I found quotes that are recent. I mean, not recent, are older. But and then of course. You know, Giles Martin told us at the listening session, and he also told me when I talked to him privately that this was very much a group album. And Ringo has said this was very much a group album. So right. it's, it, I, that's what I'm thinking that I had recently heard. You know, that like a new take on that that it wasn't so separate. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people. I think, and I originally said that it was a new take, but but apparently not. I mean, apparently they had. You know, at the time, they had said this was a group album, and even though Ringo left during, you know, some of the recording sessions, and you know, and is not even on some of the, you know, I mean, never attended some some days. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, there there were it was still at the end, it was still 
a together album, a united album, um, which, uh, given the way the individuality of the group sticks out in the music, is an in, you know, it it says it says a lot in their evolution. Um, I think, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think part of, I mean, the album is so sprawling, you know, like there's so much there that you can almost, I mean, you know, if your perception is that they're very individual, there are songs that, you know, confirm that or seem to confirm it. And if you think of them as very much a tight unit, there are songs that confirm that. But I, I would say that Abbey Road in a way, feels more cohesive than the White Album, I would say. But it might just be because the White Album is so sprawling. I think there was one um, reviewer back in the day who said something like it, it captures their, their worst and best impulses, you know, that it, 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 it uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's excessive, it's a little self-indulgent, you know, which of course they certainly had tendencies in that direction. Um, but it was also, you know, brilliant at moments. So, mm-hmm. um, have you, uh, have you been listening to any of it lately by chance? I have been listening to it. I, uh, you know, it's still great. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's still great. I mean, you know, the, the thing that I find so interesting about all this now, you know, looking back 50 years is, is well, first of all, that it's been 50 years. And, you know, I think for a lot of us who grew up with the Beatles, we since, um, you know, four years ago when we had the 50th anniversary of their arrival on the scene, and then we're, we're moving through this timeline, you know, and so now we're at, 50th anniversary of the White Album, which is pretty you know, kind of late in the game. You know, I, I guess I think of everything sort of post Pepper as like, I mean, there are many ways to punctuate the period, the whole thing, obviously. Mm-hmm. But this thing about Pepper that always struck me as kind of a, a a zenith of sorts. And then, you know, not necessarily. I don't want to suggest going downhill, but there was a sense of it, they were less shocking after that. You know, there was there was less. Um, there was less, I don't know how to, dis- not, not, there was novel, there was innovation after, but there wasn't that wow, there wasn't as much wow factor, I guess maybe I would even say, which I'm sure people will argue with me about that, but, um, it was my train of thought, but um, I, I think that th- there's something about the White Album, like getting back to, you know, where they were before all before a lot of the the, the recent wow oh I was talking about the fifth that it's been fifty years that um, you know I mean just the fact that it's been so long and that people are still well fans not maybe not the public in general but fans are still so excited about hearing these outtakes hearing these demos and um, you know it, it's just. I, 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 it's about the music, of course, but it's about so much more than that. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I, you know, I've been thinking over the last couple of days because, as you and I have talked to, I've heard the the new set. This is we're recording this about uh, two weeks before the set comes out, and I've heard it. And it's funny that one of the things that crossed my mind especially in reference to the pepper set was whether the outtakes on the on the two sets detra- what what they do to the album as a whole and i don't know that they do anything really uh, i mean they're nice to hear but i think you know the album the album still stand as they are, and that's you know that's the the albums are the important part. The released albums are are what's important. The outtakes are nice, but and and I and because I remember hearing I think Paul originally when they put out the anthology was concerned that the uh, the outtakes would somehow affect people's feelings for the albums, and I don't think that's happened at all, uh, which is really kind of funny. Well, it's interesting that that Paul would feel that way because um, my theory about the outtakes, and you and I talked about this recently, I I, I think it's that the outtakes are, you get to see their creative process. Mm -hmm. You get to see 
and here, here really, the decisions they made. So, so you know, the, the magic of this collaboration and the the artistic process that happened in the studio and and their creative process, you get to uh, see that up close and the decisions they made. And and I think it, I think there's something very thrilling about that because it it's almost like you know them better. You know that you you right. see how their minds were working when they chose take X instead of take Y to use. And so that Paul was concerned about that in a way is consistent with Paul's, uh, you know, pr sense, you know, in other words, that he didn't maybe didn't want to feel known or understood in the way that outtakes allow. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, I th and one other thing, too, is that between the pepper set and this one, they organize things a little differently. In the pepper set, all the outtakes for a particular song were lined up together. That's not the case here. And I actually enjoy listening to the outtakes here on the White Album set a little more rather than having the one, you know, the songs one one after another. Um, uh, I mean, I, I mean, with with the I you've you've heard the whole Pepper set, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel? Did you feel that hearing the the one outtake after the other on the pepper set was got was just a little tough at times, or no? Well, I mean, I think if you have a t if you like those, I think it it's fine. You know, I, I mean, t I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a strong feeling about it one way or the other. I I think that. I mean, again, it's, some days you just want to hear the record and in its remastered splendor, and other times you might want to sort of, it's kind of a different listening experience. It's more playful. It's more, it's more investigative <laughs> rather than purely enjoying the music. Right. And, and you can, I mean, you can always, you can always, if you, if you have an iPhone or, you know, or a, a, some kind of a, you know, device and, and you've, put them in iTunes or whatever, you can make playlists out of them and put those <laughs> tracks in any order you want to. Right. So you can you can put them all together like they did on the Pepper set or not, you know. Um, I mean, and also, with too, with the White Album set, there isn't the concentration of each track as there was with the, with the Pepper set because there's a lot more of the of, uh, tracks here. So, well, yeah, there's so many more songs, yeah. Right, yeah. right. So, yeah. but, so, do you think that they're going to continue like to put this stuff out forever? Um, I kind of asked Giles that in Los Angeles, and he, he kind of said, you know, they, they're hearing what the... Because I asked him, you know, you guys are you guys are now paying attention to what the fans are saying, aren't you? And he said, well, yeah, because they, you know, th there's all this passion and all this love and, and you know, you have, you have to. And I think mm -hmm. that's exactly what's going to happen. I think, you know, everybody was hoping that, for example, Let It Be would come this year and it's not going to come this year. It's going to come, they're going to, they'll do a 50th anniversary Pepper, uh, let it be. Excuse me. You're and, talking and about the film or the both. record? I think both, mm -hmm. and the same with Abbey Road. I think we're headed down that path. Now, what's going to happen with the other albums? I, you know, I don't know. They they missed, they missed everything from with the Beatles up, you know, or, uh, or please please me up, uh, you know. So, um, who knows what's going to happen? I just hope I'm around to to hear them all, and <laughs> and all those of us that are first generation fans are hoping the same thing that, you know, that we're still here for all that. You know, I don't know that. You know, that, I mean, it's that's the one thing that kind of irks me that they waited so long for this. I mean, people were people were banging on the walls, you know, in in uh, you know. 2004 uh, or 14 uh, 2014 when it was 50 years from you know Beatlemania and saying come on come on come on and and you know they did a few things but they just certainly did do 50th anniversary albums so yeah. who knows um, part of it is I mean does that does some of it have to do with the technology in other words as the technology advances more things are possible 
or is that not true? I'm, I'm not. Sure. I don't. I don't know that in four years it's it, it's been true. I th- maybe in fourteen years it's been true, but I wouldn't say in four years no. Um, but I mean, I think. I mean, people have been putting out expanded box sets. Look at what Dylan's done. I okay. mean, you know, and I to be honest, I have not. Even though I'd love to have some of that stuff, I have not bought a lot of those Dylan things. Uh, you know, I just, I mean, I have to, I have to put a, put a halt on it somewhere, you know. But, I mean, the, like the, the 65 set, I think, that he did, I would love to have that, you know. That would be fun to, fun to hear, uh, all those outtakes from there. But I, you know, I mean, look what look what he's done. I mean, he's a great example of somebody that has not, um, you know, that has not uh, uh, held back. Um, the Kinks are are just coming to that now um, with Village Green Preservation Society and that new box set that that they're putting out. Um, you know, a lot of other people have. You know, the Stones have kind of done. Con- live concerts and 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 expanded albums of of their stuff. Led Zeppelin. I mean, everybody's. Well, I think some of this is, you know, that I mean, not to be crass, but I think some of it is that they want to make money before we on us before we all die. Oh, I'm. Oh, that, uh, that's. Uh, yeah, I would. I would not. I would oh, not. I think that's what's. Dr- I don't know with the Beatles stuff. I think it's more complicated, but but I, it operates there too. But I mean, in general, I think that that's kind of what's going on. Oh, you know? sure. Uh, no, I I I definitely believe that. The, there's there's a monetary thing with the Beatles for sure. I'm, I I I think we'd all like to think there's a little more. Um, I don't know. There's a there's a higher order or right a higher goal. Right. Yeah. I I I think we'd all like to like to suggest that you know. But you know down you know at the bottom of the 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 list. I mean you have to think. Look at what the the monkeys are another example. I mean. You know they're they've been putting out reissue after reissue, and they just now put out a Christmas album um, that, by the way, has a cover of "Wonderful Christmas Time" on it. Um, so, it, as if we need another co- you know another version right. of "Wonderful Christmas Time." I think another thing that that drives some of this, and I mean, maybe, I mean, obviously they wouldn't be doing this if they didn't think there was a market for it. But I think that. You know this, like you take, you know, all the artists that you mentioned. Um, thinking about them as putting out new, quote unquote, new music. I mean, this music, and I don't. I know that I maybe just sound like a, you know, a, a, an old person, but I really, I really do think that there's something about this music that is more positive. It's more uplifting. It's more interesting. It's it's more artistry than on a lot of um, certainly the hit stuff that's around today. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm saying there's no good music coming out. Of course there is, but you know, the, the, the easily accessible music, you know, today's equivalent of top 40, right. which I, which I hear because my grandson, um, you know, tells me about what he's listening to. And it's often things, you know, from that, you know, genre and I'm kind of appalled, frankly, <laughs> at the the negativity. You know, the anger. There's a there's it's just not it's just it's just it's it, there's a lot of conflict in this music. There's a lot of it, it almost sounds dystopian to me. And again, maybe I just sound like a grouchy, a, you know, grumpy old person. But hey, you know, I am what I am. But no, but but, I, <laughs> but, but but there's a positivity in the Beatles, you know, and. And certainly in the monkeys and and a lot of the music from that period that um, the not only is it is the positivity but it also sounds like real music. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, I'm not going to argue there with you because I I completely agree. I mean I I think that that's one of the things if you talk about. 60s music and even seven not so much 70s music but 60s music on social media that's you know that's the feeling that everybody has that it's pretty much with with some minor abs- uh, exceptions um the crazy world of Arthur Brown for example i mean that that's a little that was a little weird but i mean uh, you know um 
I mean, pretty much uh, all you know, all the '60s music was very, very positive, and and I mean that was a different. It, it, it was, it was the era it was made in, you know. Right. I mean, that right. and because and uh, for the most part, the '60s up until I mean, for the most part, I mean there were you know there were protests. No, no getting around. There weren't there weren't protests in the '60s, and there was protest music. But even the protest music, for what it's worth, you know, the Buffalo Springfield. I mean, that was not as negative. That was not anywhere near near negative as some of the music today. You know, I think the thrust of it was positive. I mean, I think that the even the protest music was aspirational in that it was. It would want you know the, the the seeking change and and uh, you know sort of it, it all it envisioned a better world basically um, you know even even destruction as an example of an early you know say well that was certainly a negative song well yes and no yes but but in its uh, intent it was very. Um, you know, these songs encouraged young listeners, of which you and I were uh, among, to to kind of think about things and envision a better world. Now, I'm not saying music today doesn't do that, but it, but I think that it's really characteristic of the you know the music that we grew up with that it it was very um, aspirational, and I think a lot of that, frankly, has to do with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Does I mean the, the Beatles have have often mentioned the fact that I mean I remember hearing Paul say this and Ringo's and Ringo of course peace and love peace and love but you know the Beatles have have often accentuated the fact that their music was very positive had a lot right. of love in it and to that you know extent listening to it today you know they put that love forward and 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 the feeling is that the love from that mu- music in the '60s shines through when listening to it today. Right. Well, I think what's it was you know like what you're saying it, the music is very much a product of its political and historical cultural moment, whatever. But the fact that uh, it survived, you know, so you know that there are people who are teenagers are discovering the Beatles every day and diving into that rabbit hole of wanting to hear everything and read everything and all this. Um, I think, you know, so it was of its moment, but it transcends its moment. And, and, and that's, you know, I mean, that's what great art does. In other words, it, 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 it lives beyond its intended, you know, it lives beyond its moment and even beyond its intended audience. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it goes on forever. Um, but they do talk about the positivity, and well, they should. I mean, I think I think they should be uh, proud of it. And you know, as time goes by, and you know, now we're looking back from a vantage point of fifty years, I think that a lot of things about what they did become clearer. And I think that the positivity in the music was a very important thing. And I think it affected people in very positive ways, and still does. I mean, I'm, you know, reading, like when I, uh, you know, wrote my book and, and now reading fan quotes, and I have quotes, fan, fan quotes that, from other sources that I didn't even use in Beatleness, and I'm reading through them, and the the positivity of this idea that, you know, like it helped me through difficult times, that I, you know, every time I'm feeling depressed, I put on the Beatles, or, you know, or I just tune out the world and put the Beatles on and all this. Um you know, people have been doing that for a really long time, and you know, will continue to do it. I think into the future, there's something. Um, again, it's the positivity, the sound, the artistry, the the wisdom. You know, there's a lot there. Our thanks to Candy Leonard for talking with us, and there's actually a lot more of that discussion, and we'll save that for some future podcast. Um, More of the news. Um, We have had a look at the big Imagine book that comes that you can buy separately. Uh, It goes for about about thirty dollars on Amazon, Um, as opposed to the book that comes with the uh, Imagine set. The Amazon book is a coffee table book 
um, with pictures and, and uh, relating to the to the actual recording of the album, but with also with comments from people who were there, musicians, people like Dick Cavett, um, uh, and all sorts of people. And it's a, it's a beautiful book and a lot of pictures that you probably haven't seen elsewhere. Um, I would say though, if you're if you're if it's between the set and the book. Obviously, the answer is, you know, go for the set. But it's a beautiful book, and and and. Uh, but at thirty bucks, it's actually not bad. There are more expensive versions, including a, a signed Yoko version, that's quite expensive. Um, but um, it's it the book itself, um, the plain book itself is is really great. So, um, and one point we made last time we were talking about the. McCartney Deluxe sets, and one thing we didn't raise was the possibility of an Egypt Station Deluxe set. Now, nobody has said that this is happening, uh, but there has been a lot of speculation that it might. Nobody has said it's not happening, and given McCartney's history on these things, you know, you can only assume that something will happen, that the album will be released at some point with some uh, tracks that got left off the off the album, and he's already said that there are tracks that they didn't use. So, uh, but you know, there's another reason for you know having to reach into your pocket again, and that you know, and I still say that um, the re- the release of the archive sets before Christmas was uh, really poorly thought move. So, um, another piece of news. Uh, the Monkees released their first Christmas CD last week. And it's called Christmas Party on Rhino. And one of the tracks on the album is a cover of Wonderful Christmas Time, the Paul McCartney song. Um, the whole CD itself is kind of nice. Uh, most of the songs are done by Mickey. Uh, Mike sings lead on two, Peter sings on one, and Davey sings on two. Um, and if you get the Target version, not the the regular version, but the Target exclusive version, it has two previously released vintage bonus tracks, uh, Ryu Chiyu, um, that has a, a acapella harmony by all four members, and Christmas is My Time of Year, which is actually a sung by Davey. Um I you know I it it's it's a nice it's a nice record. Um it's kind of a follow up to Good Times. Um it's a combination of new songs, traditional songs and some vintage stuff. It's uh interesting to hear um Mike Nesmith sing the Christmas song and that song actually is kind of nice cuz it's done in a first national band style and in fact the um the song the christmas song is uh or the the credits at the end say um thanks to the first national band so um for those that are fans of nez and the first national band you'll appreciate that um so Anyway, um, but if you're going to get it, get it at Target uh, with the two extra, the two extra vintage tracks. Um, let's, see, let's turn the page here and see what else we've got. Um, here's a, a note for those of you in the San Francisco Bay Area. On October 24th, Richie Underberger, who's written many great rock books, uh, including the, um, a really good book on unreleased Beatles that's available in print and on Kindle. Um, he's doing a uh, lecture called British Rock 1970-75 with a whole bunch of 70s rockers, but also including um, Lennon, McCartney, and George Harrison. Um, he shows video. I've been to some of his lectures. He shows videos and talks about the music and and everything and it, it's a great program it'll be at the park branch of the san francisco library and the admission is free um let's talk a little bit about chart news the online charts won't be updated until tuesday which is 
today, which is actually today. Um, we're actually recording this Monday night, even though we've got it dated on Tuesday. Um, we just got the print edition uh, for October 13th, which is not the most recent edition, but we thought we'd go through the um, the listings that we'd already mentioned previously and then give you a couple of new ones. Um, the Billboard 200, Egypt 72, was uh, listed at 72, down from 55. It's further down now. Um, Beatles 1 was 163, up from 172, and Abbey Road was 190, up from 194. The top album sales in that October 13th um, issue, Paul McCartney was number 16, down from number 11. Adult Contemporary contemporary Songs, um, Come On To Me by Paul McCartney was at number 10, up from number 13. And the top rock albums, Egypt Station, was number 8, down from number 7. Okay, a look back into upcoming history. How about that? Um, October 23rd, Freddie Marston of Jerry and the Pacemakers was born in 1940. And October 25th, in 1964, the Beatles won the Ivor Neville Award for hi- the higher contribution in to music in 1963. And in 1973, on October 25th, John Lennon sued the U.S. government for tapping his phone. Um, the FBI denied the charge. Um, and pointing out there were no wiretapping logs in their Lennon surveillance file. Um, but uh, it wasn't until 1976 that John got his uh, green card to stay in America. We have a little bit of reader mail, or listener mail. Um, Astriger, an old friend of ours, um posted a note on YouTube saying, can't wait for the Super McCartney box set. Expensive but amazing. Because of the unreleased material involved, some fans say they are looking forward to this set even more than the White Album box next month. I I have to disagree with that. Um, I think the White Album box is is the better choice. Uh, As good as the McCartney set is, and this one is one of the better ones, especially the fact that he's really heard the complaints and and I know I made them in the past about the fact that he was really uh stingy with the um with the outtakes and with the archival material but uh I'm glad to see that he's uh gone a little further with this one and another listener had written in and said that they noticed the quality of the downloads on the Podbean site were hard to listen to. And that is true because the quality of the file sent to Podbean up until this point was a lower um, quality because of the storage issues on that site. But we've resolved that problem. And so the quality will be the same as the one on Fab Four Radio, which is a much higher, and also on YouTube. So, again, if you download the show from Podbean, you should notice a difference. Um, And so we thank you for letting us know and saying something. And I had, you know, I had mentioned to the reader that wrote that we had thought thought about it, and we have done it. So, there we go. Um, We are... You can, or I should say, you can find us uh, on Fab Four Radio. And again, thanks to Matt Burley for coming up with the idea. Matt, you're, you're, you, you are the man. Um, and we are on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts can be sold, can be found, sold. They're free. Um, and please, um, this is this is a big, big favor. Give us a rating on iTunes. Um, we really, I know we haven't been in existence that long, but we'd like to hear, especially good things, uh, about us. Um, we are we are working this along. Um, this the, I remember back when we started this uh, about a month and a half ago or so that we kind of struggled a little bit. Um, we've been doing things and, and getting used to the software we've been using Audacity and we're 
getting a little more expert on that. Um, but uh, thanks to everybody um, for your comments and feel free to, to tell us what you think. Tell us, uh, react to what we're saying um, and we will read mail and we will talk to you and who knows what we might do sometime. We may even do, a, I don't know, we may even do a live broadcast at some point. Who knows? I don't know. We will see. But uh, in any event, you are the ones that uh, that um, that make the difference, and we appreciate you all. That's about it. Thanks again to the fantastic Candy Leonard, author of Beetleness, for being on the show today and for the discussion. Um, I always enjoy talking with her, uh, and we will... As I said, we have more of that interview, and we will feature it again. So, uh, and if you don't have Beetleness, if you don't have her book, get it. It's available on um, Amazon, and we'll have a link on our "That's What I Want" Beetle store page. Um, and uh, it's available in print and uh, on Kindle, and it's great too. It's a it's a fantastic book. It's one of the best Beetle books, really, it's an essential Beetle book for your library. It really, really is. Um, if you want to know, um, if you're really interested in what happened um, with the Beatles and not just exactly, you know, not not just the usual stuff that you can read everywhere. This is what, what it was all about for Beetle fans. And she did a marvelous job. So thanks again, Candy. And we will be talking to you all soon. Thanks for for listening and go out and play some Beatle records. <laughs>